This is a cautionary tale for every country and every generation. The story of what happened when a civilized and cultured people surrendered its will to a charismatic political leader. The story began a hundred years ago, here in the Austrian town of Braunau, with a child born in this house, Adolf Hitler. Für Sie genügt nicht die bloße Ablegung des Bekenntnisses. Ich glaube, sondern das Schwur, ich kämpfe. When I came face to face with Hitler, I felt I had come face to face with God. He wanted to create a better world. And when he died, I had the feeling I had lost my father. In the death camps of the Second World War, Hitler's Germany came closer than human beings have ever come to creating hell on earth. The terrible truth, which most people still find too terrible to accept, is that despite his crimes against humanity, Hitler was a political genius, a man with a fatal attraction for the German people. At his peak, the most popular leader in Europe. The child born here in Braunau belonged to that handful of human beings who have clearly and decisively changed the history of the 20th century. The ultimate target of Hitler's racist ambitions in the East was Soviet Russia, populated, he believed, by inferior races. But in a move of brilliant cunning, he astonished the world in the summer of 1939 by doing a deal with Stalin, whom he planned later to overthrow. The purpose of this cynical deal was to isolate Hitler's next victim, Poland. With Stalin on his side, Hitler was sure nobody else would interfere when he attacked the Poles. The 1st of September, 1939. The German attack on Poland begins the Second World War. To Hitler's surprise, Britain and France declare war on Germany. Their intervention, however, fails to help the Poles. Hitler didn't want a general war. What he wanted, and there I have no doubt about this, he wanted a war to destroy Poland. That he was prepared for. For a moment, he was disconcerted to find that he might be involved in war with Britain and France because this had never been his plan. He had always regarded Britain as his natural ally. But in the end, he accepted, look, I have a Nazi-Soviet pact which guarantees that this will not develop into a general war. I should be able to knock Poland out in three weeks, which he more or less did. After that, the West isn't going to start up a war again. Many Germans were worried when they found themselves at war with Britain and France. There was none of the jubilation with which Hitler and many others had gone to war in 1914. Germans had got so used to the Fuhrer's knack of getting what he wanted easily and without war that their faith was momentarily shaken. Never did we think he would come to war. I never believed it could happen after all what had happened before. and. Uh, England and France had so often given in with Czechoslovakia and all the kind of things that we never thought that that could happen. Never. That was one of the things where you thought, good God, what is he doing? Am Morgen des 5. Juni treten deutsche Panzerdivisionen zum Angriff über die Somme an. In May 1940, Hitler decides to knock out France and Britain before continuing his war of conquest in the East. In six weeks, a German blitzkrieg defeats France and forces Britain to evacuate its troops from the continent. The worries which most Germans had felt about the war in September 1939 dissolve. Paris is Hitler's. Madeleine in Paris fühlt sich jeder wie im Paradies. Jeder Mund lächelt freundlich dir zu, jeder Blick sagt dir heimlich nur du. Da sagte man nicht, Monsieur, 
dann sagt nur man Mami. Man darf nicht, man darf nicht, man darf nur Rachelin. Auf der Rue Madeleine in Paris fühlt sich jeder wie im Paradies. When France fell to us in 1940, I don't think there were many Germans who didn't applaud it, including my usually imperturbable grandmother. That evening at the dinner table, she said, you gotta hand it to Adolf Hitler. He has finally paid him back for Elsass and Lovell. Hitler came back the Berlin. Well, it was a terrific, a triumphant victory when he came. Everybody was smiling. We were frantic with joy, really, that at last France had gone. And we were quite certain that soon we would be in England. The church bells rang all day, and the mood of elation really penetrated throughout the country. My feelings towards Hitler were uh, such uh, as if he were uh, some superhuman being between man and a god. He was sent by Providence, that's what he told the German people all the time. He was sent by Providence and his fatal attraction, the whole people believed it, I too. I even wanted to die for him. I adored him so much that I wanted to give my life away for him if there had been a chance to do so. Never again does Hitler's popularity reach such a peak. He now intends to use his hold over the German people to lead them into a war they do not want, a war of conquest and genocide in the East. For the moment, he deludes the cheering crowds into believing that after victory over Britain, Germany's triumph will be complete. From now on, Germany was absolutely in a position to direct the course of the war. All we had to defeat now, we believed, was Britain and Europe would be in our hands. Oberstleutnant Galland besteigt seine Maschine. The German fighter ace Adolf Galland also thinks the next priority is the Battle of Britain. But when he meets Hitler, he discovers that the Fuhrer's priorities are different. I talked to him that our good time would come and we could bomb London and the fighters could, the English fighters couldn't take off. And they said, no, 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 <clears throat> stop this. I don't like this. I really don't like the fight against England. The English people are so similar people to the Germans and I have the highest respect for the English building up an empire. So, and you must understand, I'm forced to fight this fight against England, but I don't like it. I think that he himself had not got any great wish to engage on an invasion of Britain. Because all the time, by now, we know he was already beginning to get itchy and wanting to turn eastwards after defeating France. But Goering insisted that with the Luftwaffe, with the Air Force alone, he could knock Britain out. So he gave him his head to try. And that was a decisive defeat. But it was not really a setback to Hitler's main plan. June 1941. Hitler travels to his Eastern Front headquarters, the Wolf's Lair, so called after his nickname, Wolf. The Fuhrer is in high spirits as he arrives to direct the attack on Russia. The Second World War, he believes, will be decided on the Eastern Front. The 
These are the forgotten, virtually indestructible ruins of the wolf's lair, where Hitler will spend most of the next few years. From here, he pursues the two great obsessions of his political career, the conquest of a great empire in the East and the destruction of the Jews. Russia will be defeated, he believes, well before winter sets in. We have only to kick in the door, Hitler boasts, and the whole rotten edifice will come crashing down. The German master race, he orders, must show no pity to the inferior Russians. Artillerie and Panzer kämpfen die Straße wieder frei. June the 22nd, 1941. Operation Barbarossa. Hitler's offensive takes the German people as well as the Russian army by surprise. But the anxiety many Germans feel is outweighed by their faith in the Führer. He had been so right in everything, whatever he did, whether it was Poland, whether it was France, whether he walked through Belgium and so on, wherever he went, it went like, like lightning. No real uh, fighting and so on. Uh, that we thought, well, uh, perhaps he knows better, perhaps he has some armament which will do it. Not merely did the German forces have no new armaments, they had no winter clothing either. When the winter campaign comes, Hitler's forces freeze. The offensive grinds to a halt. Germans are alarmed by the first publicly admitted setback of the war, but they quickly rally round. Hitler had given them the good times. It was their duty to stand by him in the bad. Well, we all gave, and I remember my husband took his best clover out and gave it to them, and I know my neighbor, who was always against, he said, don't give it, it won't reach the German soldiers in, in Russia, don't give it, keep it for yourself. But my, my husband said, we all have to give, everybody has to give. Summer 1942 brings a new German offensive in the East, new German successes and a return of confidence. But although the ordinary soldiers have lost none of their faith in the Führer, Hitler is heading towards the abyss. He hasn't the resources to conquer Russia. With America now also at war against him, German defeat is only a matter of time. But Hitler still believes his willpower can sweep aside all obstacles. We now get to the period when Hitler is constantly and trapped in his own beliefs. He created a myth about himself, which he worked very hard at, that he was the man sent by Providence to save Germany and so on, and many people came to believe this in the days of his success and so on. Alas, he came to, from his point of view, not from ours, he came to believe it too. Disaster strikes at Stalingrad in January 1943. Here, at the furthest point of Hitler's advance into Russia, a great German army is surrounded by the Russians. After savage fighting, 90,000 surrender. The myth of Hitler's invincibility is shattered. Privately, Hitler tells his staff, what you are witnessing is a catastrophe of unheard of dimensions. Publicly, Nazi propaganda claims Stalingrad is a minor setback. Wir uns 
After Stalingrad, Hitler was a changed man. The great public speaker of the 1930s became a semi-recluse, spending much of his time here at his Eastern Front headquarters, the so-called Wolf's Lair. Visitors to the Wolf's Lair described the atmosphere as a mixture of a monastery and a camp. The great mass of Germans never saw Hitler again. He avoided visits to the front. He made no tours of bombed cities. He gave only two major speeches for the remainder of the war. Yet such was the faith which the mass of Germans had acquired in the Fuhrer over the past decade, that it survived even disaster at Stalingrad. Faith in the Fuhrer is further tested by massive British and American bombing raids on German cities. Over 300,000 civilians are killed. But though bombing strengthens the fear of defeat, morale does not crack. We were sitting in the cellar day and night, mostly by night. People were sitting there in the cellar uh, trembling and we saw uh, uh, the walls uh, shivering, yes, the walls were trembling uh, and uh, those nights we can never forget in our lives. I, I cannot forget ever. We asked ourselves why are they doing this to our Hitler and uh, we were told by everyone because they hated the Führer because the Führer wanted to create a better world. Maybe Churchill and Roosevelt thought they could demoralize the German people with bombing and make them surrender, but uh, he reached the opposite of it. When a ship is in a storm, you stand by your captain, for better or for worse. Dem feiervollen Gedenken grüßt der Führer verwundete deutsche Soldaten dieses Krieges. As the tide turns in the Second World War, the nature of German loyalty to Hitler changes. The ardor goes, but the dependence remains. Quite simply, there was no one else for most Germans to turn to. The Allied demand for Germany's unconditional surrender, Hitler's insistence on final victory, and the traditional habit of obedience bind Führer and people in a community of fate which will be torn apart only by defeat and degradation. Auschwitz, Poland, the gateway to the most terrible place on earth. The most enduring monument to Hitler's anti-Semitic paranoia. His mission was, he said, to cleanse the German world of the Jewish poison. In this great human slaughterhouse alone, over two million Jews went to their deaths. Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, was put in charge of a secret plan for genocide. Secret because only a minority of fanatical Nazis shared Hitler's anti-Semitic obsession. Mass killings began in Eastern Europe at the beginning of the Russian campaign. The first SS executions, however, took place not in the camps, but in the countryside. German army officer Axel von den Buscher, then serving on the Eastern Front, unexpectedly saw the SS at work. The regimental um, clerk a sergeant came in my office as ADC and said, you've got to go out to the airport, something is happening which you won't believe. So I went out half a mile through some woods, marvelous, cool, dry autumn day, sun shining. There were trucks coming from the city, from the ghetto, which I found out later. A long queue of about six, eight hundred Yards of naked people were queuing up and moving forward, went into this long queue and went into these mass graves prepared to lie like herrings in a tin and being shot in their neck. Responsibility in this kind of hierarchy is always with the Führer. There is absolutely no doubt that number one had to know and had given verbal mafia-like advice. Anybody who thinks differently just doesn't know how this kind of organization works. 
he would never write. He was sly enough not to give orders with top secret. Never. This would work through word of mouth under all sorts of pseudo humanitarian things. Too many people, we can't feed them and so on. For the final solution, as it was euphemistically called, shooting was not sufficient. It killed only hundreds at a time. To kill millions, Hitler ordered a new technology of genocide to be secretly installed at death camps in Poland. Before they are sent to the gas chambers, the Jews are ordered to undress. Their clothes are collected by members of the so-called special commandos, Jews who are forced to work for the SS. The victims are told they are going to have showers and be de-last. Their hair, removed by the special commandos, is later sold to German factories. תגידו לנו את האמת? שאלתי, ואם תדע את האמת, יהיה לך יותר קל. ולא ידענו בעצמנו מה לעשות. לשקר בוודאי לא טוב. להגיד את האמת, אנשים נכנסו לפאניקה. The victims are pushed into the gas chambers hundreds at a time. Cyclone B gas capsules are dropped through the ceiling. קודם כל היה מזכיר את המשפחה בבית. איפה שהסתכלת, ראית דמיון של האבא, של האימא, של הילדים. כן, אם חשבנו על זה, שגם... Gassed with the Jews are gypsies, homosexuals, Poles, Russian prisoners of war. All the gas chambers and crematoria are in occupied Poland to keep their functioning as secret as possible. But inevitably, rumors begin to circulate in Germany. We suspected and we heard it by uh, some other people uh, telling uh, about it, but like this, uh, with with a hand in front of their mouth, because you had, had to be always uh, be careful that not an SR man or a Gestapo man was standing nearby and witness what you were talking. Uh, otherwise, you would have been sent yourself to, the, to a concentration camp. Though the great majority of Germans did not support genocide, years of anti-Semitic propaganda had left their mark. The average German certainly did not care any longer what happened to the Jews. That is particularly true from 1943 on when we, when we came under the incessant Allied bombing. Uh, I remember having been told by a German officer on the Western Front that we were engaged in genocide. First of all, I didn't believe him. In fact, I was ready to turn him into the Gestapo. And secondly, it simply didn't penetrate. It didn't make any sense. It didn't make any economic sense. We needed these people as slave labor. The only person known to have challenged Hitler about the final solution was Henrietta von Schirach. Because she had known Hitler since her childhood, she had no compunction about going to see him after accidentally witnessing Jews being rounded up in Amsterdam. And then so I told him what I'd seen. 
His reply was, you're sentimental. Then there was a terrible row. He stood up. I stood up. I said, Herr Hitler, you ought not to be doing that. I thought I can allow myself to say such a thing because I've known him so long. I've hurt him deeply. What's more, in front of other men who were there. Then Hitler said, Every day, 10,000 of my best soldiers die on the battlefield, while the others carry on living in the camps. That means the biological balance in Europe is not right anymore. How to react, how to stop, how to avoid, that was the question. This is Hitler. He's got to be eliminated with all means, without any reserve. The underground opposition to Hitler, to which Busher belonged, was motivated not just by moral outrage, but by the conviction that Hitler was leading Germany to inevitable defeat. They also knew that only assassination could snap the bonds of loyalty which still bound millions to Hitler. The ever-watchful Gestapo made opposition very difficult, the only plotters with access to the Führer were army officers. The officer who came closest to killing Hitler was Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg. He had his opportunity at a briefing on the 20th of July, 1944. The briefing and the attempt on Hitler's life took place in a conference building which stood on this site. Stauffenberg put his briefcase containing the two pounds of explosive beneath the conference table not far from Hitler. Shortly afterwards, claiming that he had to make a phone call, he left the building. A few minutes later, there was an enormous explosion. Though Hitler in fact survived, the bomb plot had almost succeeded. Four of those in the briefing were fatally injured. Hitler himself staggered from the building, convinced that Providence had delivered him. Behind the smile of the survivor lurked the rage of a man intent upon a terrible revenge. On Hitler's orders, the ringleaders of the bomb plot were strung up from these hooks by piano wire and their death agonies specially photographed for him. I saw how Hitler grabbed at these photographs and how he looked at it with cruelty and gleefully. And uh, I saw the, the face of one of my friends, of Peter Graf York, who was exe executed among these people. And um, I was so terribly shocked about how Hitler acted in this moment that um, I had to leave the room. When I heard that German officers had tried to kill Hitler, I was enraged. I fully concurred with the uh, uh, sentence that was imposed on them. Strangling, I thought, was too good for them. This was the time precisely when we were in a very uh, precarious military situation and the only man who could possibly stave off disaster was Adolf Hitler. That opinion was shared by many Germans. Germans who did not uh, adore Hitler, did not belong to the party. By winter, most Germans realized that defeat was only a matter of time. Hitler was visibly tiring. His earlier military inspiration had long deserted him. His strategy now was simply to hold out whatever the cost. For German civilians training for the final showdown, the motive for fighting now was less loyalty to Hitler than fear of being overrun by the massive Russian army rumbling towards Berlin. Early April 1945, and the Red Army reaches Berlin. Thousands of Germans are captured. His Grand Chancellery now severely damaged. Hitler was directing his depleted forces from the safety of a bunker 50 feet beneath the earth. This two-story complex, wrapped in concrete, 
was to be a last home for both him and Ava Brown, who had come to join him. Ava was given a bed sitter next to Hitler's little suite. The rooms were sparsely furnished. The air was stuffy, despite a ventilation system whose shrill, monotonous whine penetrated everywhere. Hitler rarely left this claustrophobic fantasy world. Although his contact with reality was slipping, he retained the ability to delude and inspire his bunker staff. It was about March or April when the situation in Berlin was rather hopeless. He was all of a sudden interested to see the model of Linz. Linz was his home city and he uh, had special planes to make it uh, the most beautiful town of Austria. And he took a few of his people and secretaries to accompany him and we went over there and he stood in front of this model and he was just excited. He was so happy and he, uh, Speer had to explain to him every detail of the new gallery and the beautiful places he, he, was, he planned. And uh, I stood there and watched him and I thought, maybe it's not all hope lost if he can plan for the future in that way. But I think it was only an escape for him in his daydream of architecture. Outside the bunker, most Germans by now are resigned to defeat, longing for an end to the war. Only among the Hitler youth does the Fuhrer still have followers who have not despaired of victory. For them, the fatal attraction holds firm to the end. This last film of Hitler shows him reviewing war heroes from his youth movement, among those he pats feebly on the cheek is Wilhelm Hübner. I told Hitler that I was a messenger boy for the army, and perhaps that struck a chord with him, because he'd been a regimental messenger during the First World War. Anyway, he then patted my cheek and said, well done, my boy. Didn't you realize at the time that the war was lost? No, not at all. We boys still thought, and we'd heard rumors, that the Führer somehow had a secret weapon in reserve. In fact, there were no secret weapons. On the day the Russians started smashing their way into Berlin, Hitler flew into a rage. After shrieking at his officers that they had betrayed him, he admitted for the first time that all was lost. He then stepped into the passage where Ava and the secretaries were waiting. All of a sudden, the door was open. Hitler came out. He said with a very, very uh, grave face, everything is lost. Pack your things and go. You have to leave in, in, in within an hour. The last plane will bring you out of Berlin. He didn't look at us, actually. Then, after a moment of silence, Eva Brown stepped forward, went to him, took his hand and said, but you know I stay with you. I wouldn't go. And he smiled, he tried to smile and he kissed her on the lips. And somehow, in this moment, it was just following Eva Brown, we said, we all said, we stay, we are staying too. And then he, he was sort of relieved, I would say. And he said, I wish my generals would be as brave as you are. The generals now left. Only a few officers stayed with Hitler's little court. The atmosphere was very gloomy in the bunker. And the other people, the... the, the they talked about uh, how to commit suicide. That was the, the main topic about um, their talks. Um, and uh, whether they should um, uh, take poison, uh, poison themselves, or whether they should uh, shoot uh, um, with a pistol. It was just like talking about recipes for cooking. We, we talked about recipes for making suicide. And it just was to, to overcome the fear, actually. We, we tried to be calm, but actually it was not, really. It was a sort of trance. And um, 
in one of these discussions, I asked I ask Hitler um, why he don't, didn't fight in the battle as a commander do, should in the war. And he said, no, it's impossible. I'm much too weak to fight. And I would never risk to get captured alive because he knew what happened to Mussolini. He saw the pictures and he, he was very, very frightened to have the same fate if he would be captured. On the 28th of April, Hitler's fellow dictator Mussolini and his mistress had been shot by Italian partisans, their bodies mutilated and strung up in a Milan square. Hitler was incapable of leading his troops in the way he had led his stormtroopers through the streets of Munich 20 years earlier. He was ill and prematurely aged. Hitler was hauptsächlich psychosomatic krank. Hitler suffered primarily from psychosomatic illnesses, mainly stomach cramps. Now, these had first occurred back in the 20s and had continued at varying intervals right up to the time I saw him. In addition, he suffered from a shaking left arm and, to a lesser extent, a quivering left leg, though this only became apparent after the assassination attempt in July 44. When I saw Hitler, none of his remarks during my treatment of him suggested madness. There was nothing extraordinary about his behavior. Of course, one must differentiate between someone who is mad and someone who is abnormal. He was definitely not mad, in my opinion. The Soviet army hacked its way towards the center of Berlin. His mystical union with the German people now almost at an end, Hitler decided to marry his long-suffering mistress, Eva Braun. On April the 29th, a municipal official was hastily pulled out of the front line and hurried to the map room. After the bridal couple had confirmed they were of true Aryan descent, the ceremony was concluded with Goebbels and Bormann as the witnesses. Hitler signed the wedding certificate, but when it came to Eva's turn, she began to write her surname as Braun, before crossing out the letter B and writing Eva Hitler. Arm in arm, Adolf Hitler led his bride to the study for the wedding reception. Eva put on the one record that could be found in the bunker. It was called Red Roses. Hitler joked, and the guests drank Tokai. There was talk of happier times. I think if a, a Hitler married Eva Braun as a gesture of gratitude for her love, for her loyalty, for her fidelity, and I think he wanted to compensate for her as she was not allowed to live with him, that she was at least allowed to die with him and be honored, therefore, to get the figure of history as his wife. This is the last photograph of Hitler alive, with the Russians only a few hundred yards away. Shortly afterwards, he went down into the bunker for the last time. And there he stood, very quiet, very tired, very pale, looking in to nothing. And he came towards me, shook hand, and murmured something. And I was so nervous that I didn't understand what he said. And then he turned and I, I felt somehow like frozen because I knew now that this is a decisive moment where he would go into his room and shoot himself. But then Eva Braun was still there and she came towards me, embraced me and said, try to go home, try to get out of here. And if you are successful, if you come to Bavaria back, give my greeting, my regards to everybody. And she was very sad and I think she tried to be very brave in this moment. 
Less than two days after the wedding, on April the 30th, Hitler and his bride retired to his study. They sat on the couch. Opposite them was a portrait of Hitler's mother. On an iron clothes rack hung a dog leash. Hitler's dog had been sacrificed, testing the poison. Ava now took a cyanide capsule and popped it into her mouth. She died instantly. Then Hitler picked up his gun, put it to his right temple and fired. That was the shot Hitler ended his life with. And I was sitting there and all of a sudden I had a feeling of of hate. I felt so lonely. I felt so um, lost. And I didn't know what to do actually. Acting in accordance with Hitler's instructions, members of his staff wrapped both the bodies in blankets and carried them up to the surface. During a pause in the Russian shelling, they doused the bodies with what petrol they had managed to collect and set them alight. Later, they buried the incompletely burnt corpses in shallow graves. The charred remains were discovered by the Russians when they overran the bunker. On May the 7th, a week after Hitler's suicide, Germany surrenders. The Führer died without pity for the people who had followed him so loyally. He had warned them two years before that if Germany were defeated, they would be to blame. Wenn mein eigenes Volk an einer solchen Prüfung zerbrechen würde, könnte ich darüber dann keine Träne weinen. Es hätte nichts anderes verdient. Es würde sein eigenes Schicksal sein, dass es sich selbst zuzuschreiben hat. Germans are now brought face to face with the reality of genocide. Lampshades made from human skin. Human organs extracted in sadistic medical experiments. Hitler's Germany had ended not as he had promised in national renewal, but in national degradation. Mounds of human bodies, starved and tortured to satisfy the Fuhrer's racist obsession. The fatal attraction had made possible the final solution. The remains of the bunker where Hitler committed suicide are close to this mound in the death strip along the Berlin Wall. Ironically, the division of Germany is one of the legacies of Hitler's defeat. The thousand year Reich promised by Adolf Hitler lasted only 12 years. That horrific episode in German history was the product not of some incurable strain of German megalomania, but of the fatal attraction for the German people in the midst of a terrible crisis of Hitler's messianic vision of a great national revival. With total defeat in the Second World War, the suicide of the Fuhrer and the appalling revelations of the death camps, the spell was broken. I can't change the past and I can't, I can't deny that I was fascinated by Hitler's personality, that I liked him as a friendly and a polite and a very fatherly chief. And it was the most interesting time of my life. But when I came out of the bunker and home from prison, and I realized what really had happened in the world, what damage, what misery he had brought to millions of people, I was very much shocked and ashamed. And um, when I experienced the first time in my life what democracy can be, what freedom means, I can only wish that there would never ever again any other Hitler in the world. <laughs> 